today's history video, I'd like to talk a bit about Dwight D. Eisenhower as a general. Uh, many people, I think, underestimate his military ability because they look at him in the sense of a general, in the sense of Robert E. Lee, uh, a general who manu maneuvers his forces, moves them around, uh, does flank attacks and stuff like that. That was much more General MacArthur, who we'll talk about in a few weeks. Eisenhower was the first diplomat general, the first general who basically realized that in modern warfare, uh, you have got to have coalitions. You've got to hold the coalitions together, have them work together, integrate them seamlessly, and that the real threat is not so much from the enemy as that your own coalition will spin apart and work at cross purposes with each other. He had a very difficult job to meld the British and the American uh, forces that fought in World War II. Uh, on the one hand, there was a power that was fading from the scene, Britain, but still anxious to protect its prestige and its empire back then. It still had an empire in World War II. Uh, and the United States that was the coming nation. And as an American, he was particularly conflicted because he had to deal both with his own nationals, who he'd grown up with and served with at West Point and in the army, uh, and sometimes put them down and elevate the generals from Britain, the other country. The other problem was not just egos. Uh, it was a fundamental difference in war aims between Churchill and Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt's view was that the most important thing was to defeat the Nazis and to defeat the Japanese, uh, and that we should adopt the shortest, direct, most direct route possible. Churchill was much more concerned about the post-war balance of power and was concerned about stopping Russia from occupying all of Eastern Europe. Uh, from that point of view, uh, Churchill wanted a dash to Berlin so that Berlin and Germany would clearly be occupied by the West, not by the Russians. Uh, and he favored meeting the Russian army much, much further over to the East than, uh, than the occupation zone specified. Eisenhower went ahead and met the Russians much farther east, two or three hundred miles beyond the demarcation line that had been negotiated at the Yalta Agreement, but then pulled back to the occupation line and let the Russians occupy their territory. It was not only a fundamental difference in outlook, in tradition, uh, and in the whole notion of what the war was about. Uh, Eisenhower also had to deal with the personalities of his generals. Uh, Montgomery wanted to be totally in charge, and Patton, of course, wanted to be in charge. Uh, Eisenhower had a lifelong friendship with Patton uh, and really single-handedly saved Patton's career on many an occasion. But yet he had to put Montgomery in overall charge of the land war because he was Montgomery and because the British needed to have that concession. And then on top of that, he had to deal with the Russians, uh, both in terms of the issue of allocation, of how much material should we send Russia in Lend-Lease to keep her in the war and help her win, and how much should go to the American forces beefing up for the D-Day invasion. Uh, and dealing with the Russians on all kinds of diplomatic levels. So Eisenhower, in a real sense, served in World War II as the assistant president, uh, much more than the commanding general. And uh, it was a fascinating role and one that he pioneered and handled very, very well. Thanks for watching.